Hello ladies, welcome to Homemakers Radio. I hope that you can get a few things done while you listen today. I was thinking today about how disarray and disorganization can give us a heightened sense of anxiety and in that respect how important it is to get ready, to get yourself dressed because if you do have some kind of lack of focus, somehow getting dressed and getting all neatened up can help and might even make the whole day work out better. And I have noticed sometimes the worst problems in the home happen when the mother's not really in gear. She's not really ready. So take some time out. If your family wants things, if they're pressuring things, excuse yourself for a few minutes. Go into the bathroom and get yourself ready. Before you go, I'd like to share my teacup with you. It has a beautiful aqua background and it's called Duchess and someone gave it to me years ago. I was reading a comment about how uh, someone said they went for a 10 minute walk in the morning and a 10 minute walk at night and I was thinking as I was reading that and by the way your comments are very helpful I was thinking as I was reading that, when did it change? Because that really was a normal way of life. And those of us who are older remember it. And some of you might still remember it. But it is a habit that we have got to restore. There's no point in saying, uh, I wish I was back in the olden days. And I wish I was, you know, I was born at the wrong time. Because you can restore it. You can make life how it ought to be just by doing these things. And also teaching the next generation how to live and how to uh, how to enjoy life and again and not to live by what the world is doing what the government's doing what the media is doing just get that completely out of your mind they're not going to help you and so these comments that I've been reading just reminded me of how things used to be and I got to thinking when did it change and how did it change well when industry became the way that people earned their living and they had to get up at a certain time and go work for eight hours and then come home at five very tired have dinner and then just I guess you know watch a television program because it it relaxed the mind so much and they didn't want to think about too much then they would do that instead of going for a walk but we can change all this and I would really suggest you do that and keep yourself a little journal or diary and see if there are any changes in the way you think or any changes in the way that you do things or just kind of write about your mood or how you feel after you have done this. Uh, You know, we could probably all afford a 10 minute walk in the morning and a 10 minute walk at night. Probably cost us nothing but time. And uh, we need to take time to do this even if we're behind in things. Go ahead and make that part of your life anyway, no matter what. And so I want to read a little bit uh, from the Jane Austen diet book. And I have spoken of this before. And it's called, it's written by Brian Kozlowski. And the chapter I'm going to read is chapter 5 called Walk Like an Elizabeth. (laughs) Exercise in Austin World. It's difficult to imagine Jane using the word exercise at all. Surely her innocent mind never knew the cruel tortures that word now encapsulates. The sweat and pain when we do it, the guilt and shame when we don't, only to repeat again tomorrow or next New Year's for those completely pummeled by the experience. Is there any ruder reminder that we're not living in a Jane Austen novel? And yet Jane does use the word exercise. Uses it quite a lot, as a matter of fact. Uses it, loves it, wraps a Regency ribbon around it, and gifts it to her heroines like a life-changing lottery ticket. Is there any felicity in the world superior to this? And all without the slightest trace of sadism. There are over a hundred reminders to exercise in Jane's novels, and not one of them is laced with guilt and misery, or more sweat than Regency elegance would allow. 
No, the tale of exercising in Austin world is a different story altogether. For one, exercise in Jane's novels is only viewed as something fun and enjoyable. The pure, genuine pleasure of the exercise, she calls it. Austin heroines exercise because they want to, not because they have to. It's a legitimate treat. Don't you remember running when you were about nine years old and thinking how good it felt and how fast you can ru- you could run and how well you could stretch yourself? And it was never painful. Sometimes we breathed so hard, though, and that sweet air in our lungs just stretched our lungs, too, and felt so good. <clears throat> For one, exercise in Jane's novels is only viewed as something fun and enjoyable, the pure, genuine pleasure of the exercise, she calls it. Austin heroines exercise because they want to, not because they have to. It's a legitimate treat. Lizzie likes to indulge herself in exercise. Catherine gave herself up to the enjoyment of exercise, and Anne experiences genuine pleasure from the exercise. Words are comfortable. Words like comfortable and delightful and even snug define their daily workouts with nobody getting too strenuous or pushing their bodies to a level of physical pain. A face glowing with the warmth of exercise is about the most intense after effect you're likely to get while exercising in Austin world. Anyone who's been to a gym in the last decade will find all of this fantastically or even amusingly odd. The ground rules are so different there, condensed into something cheery like no workout is really effective unless it ends you with being flailed on the floor in breathless agony. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? More hardcore gyms put up helpful postures. Just in case us namby pamby weaklings forget it. Crawling is acceptable. Falling is acceptable. Crying is acceptable. Pain is acceptable. Quitting is not. Austin would only roll her eyes and tell us to lighten up. Lizzie's eyes are only ever brightened by the exercise, never teared by it. Because it turns out, Jane's advice to keep exercise as light, pleasurable, and as easy as possible isn't a sign of weakness at all, but of brilliant scientific sense. Humans have a built-in reflex to avoid discomfort whenever we can. Embracing the modern no-pain-no-gain compulsion to exercise might sound powerful and plucky, but your brain and biology will constantly rail against it and uh, usually win. Austin figured this out in Mansfield Park. Nothing ever fatigues me but doing what I do not like. Well, that's one of the reasons why when I come here I like to encourage everybody to make their uh, homemaking and housework and duties at home and responsibilities at home a joy and find ways to make yourself like it by making it easier, making it more beautiful, making it more comfortable, and just in general making it a a delight. And so I think we can do better than they even did in the olden days and, and make it something that is, uh, you're made better by the exercise. It's the main reason why strict exercise regimens are so difficult to maintain, why New Year's fitness resolutions end by February, and why gyms have some of the biggest dropout rates on the planet. An infinite few of us actually like what the exercise has become. Our biggest problem, we've gotten far beyond what Austin knew and loved about truly effective exercising in the first place. So then the name of this next part is The Felicities of Rapid Motion. Jane's novels are some of the first books to embrace what we would now call intuitive exercise. The belief that simply being in motion feels good and is good for our bodies, far better than trying to endlessly force them beyond their biological comfort zone. A more accurate word to encapsulate Austin's broader exercise philosophy would be motion size. 
Alas, if only it didn't sound like a 1980s step aerobics class. Because the characters with, with the simple drive to move more, to enjoy the felicities of rapid motion, are the healthiest, fittest, happiest people in Austin world. I am not born to sit still and do nothing, says the vivacious Mary Crawford in Mansfield Park, spurning all attempts to keep her down. After sitting a little while, Miss Crawford was up again, saying, I must move. Resting fatigues me. In Northanger Abbey, all other girls are insipid compared to Catherine Moreland, who finds that nothing but motion was voluntary to her. Catherine was not naturally sedentary, and it seemed as if she would even walk about the house rather than remain fixed for any time in the parlor. That's why I think it's so sad, you know, to send kids to schools and tell them to sit still. I think that we are we are we have natural movements that that shouldn't be imposed upon uh, in especially in uh, children the same love for frequent movement is shared by emma eleanor mary marianne and lizzie whose fondness for being frequently up and about comes across as almost wild to the sedentary needle pointing bingley sisters and here is a little boxed uh, statement here I must move it's worth noting how revolutionary these energetic female characters were for the time like most women of the era Jane grew up in a world that defined femininity in far less animated terms to then contemporary male thinkers like Edmund Burke female beauty always carries with it an idea of weakness women are very sensible of this for which reason they learn to lift, to totter in their walk, to counterfeit weakness and even sickness. This peeved proto-feminist Mary Wollstonecraft, who labeled such talk ridiculous jargon, and it angered Austin too. Do not consider me now as an elegant female, but as a rational creature, says Lizzie to Mr. Collins, proving her true feminine strength with a flaunting quick step out of the room. As for the more stationary bodies of Austin world, Jane is equally clear about the consequences. Ill health and a great deal of indolence define Lady Bertram in Mansfield Park. She was permanently plastered to the sofa throughout the novel. Another perpetual sitter, Mr. Woodhouse, in Emma, looks and feels a much older man than he really is. Without activity of body, a simple half-mile stroll is beyond his comprehension. It's such a distance, he mutters weakly. I could not walk half so far. Then there's persuasion, where we first we meet Mary Musgrove lying on the faded sofa, and soon pick up on Austin's hint that Mary's frequent illnesses are a direct result of her not being supposed a good walker. This was common knowledge, circa 1800. Georgian doctors viewed the body as a sort of machine, that needs regular movement to work properly. There must be frequent motions, said Joseph Addison in 1711, or the engine of the body is liable to rust up. It's why Austin characters, people like Frank Churchill in Emma, who sits still when he ought to move, are always playing a risky game with their health. It's fascinating to witness how modern science has recently returned to that core belief. The very unregency phenomenon of seeing exercise as only that sweaty thing you do between this and that o'clock is entirely wrong. Moving more throughout the day is now regarded as markedly healthier than spending an exhausting hour at the gym after a full day of sitting. Your body is indeed a sort of machine a biological engine that runs best when you move it more frequently, not necessarily more vigorously. And back in the 1960s, when a lot of women went to work, there were uh, magazines that came out with a five-minute exercise or just a throughout-the-day exercise of things that you could do to keep fit while you were in an office. You know, ways to stretch and ways to move even uh, when you stood up or when you sit down, how to keep fit, because it was such they were such sedentary jobs. 
This fact was rediscovered in 1953. When scientists in Britain observed that workers who stood or moved more throughout the day, such as train conductors on their feet collecting fares, postmen on their bikes delivering letters, um, had less coronary heart illness than workers with more sedentary jobs, such as bus drivers and office workers, sitting for a prolonged period of time throughout the day, a la Lady Bertram, effectively shuts your body engine down, muscles stop firing, blood stops circulating properly, and the mechanisms that regulate health, healthy blood sugar and cholesterol levels deteriorate, all dramatically increasing your risk of obesity, heart disease, and diabetes. Sitting is the new smoking, said umpteen thousand articles published every year. No doubt a happy vindication for Mrs. Norris in Mansfield Park. Idling away all your time upon a sofa is a very foolish trick, she said. But those articles are a bore. Mrs. Norris is a twit, and Austin, you remember, never liked to dwell on guilt and misery. So let's quickly turn to her anecdote for the idleness and folly, the best ways to get moving with the best bodies of Austin world. And it all begins with nothing beyond a walk. I walk. I prefer walking. I won't beat around the shrubbery. Everything happens on a walk in Jane's novels. Darcy proposes to Elizabeth on a walk. Marianne meets Willoughby on a walk. Lucy Steele drops the I'm engaged to Edward bomb on a walk. Harriet is nearly attacked by gypsies on a walk and lives to tell the tale. Anne Elliot and Captain Wentworth hook up again on a walk. Yet none of this feels remotely cliched or unconvincing, as if Jane merely ran out of convenient plot settings. On the contrary, her novel's most important walks usually fade seamlessly into the fabric of ordinary life for her characters. These people are walking all the time anyway, and just how much of it is quite impressive. The Bennett girls in Pride and Prejudice walk six to eight miles every week just by going back and forth from their home at Longbourn to the nearby village at Meryton. The village of Longbourn was only one mile from Meryton, a most convenient distance for the young ladies who were usually tempted thither three or four times a week. The Dashwoods, in Sense and Sensibility, often walked up from the cottage to Sir John's residence at Barton Park, half a mile. Marianne is also on one of her usual walks about a mile and a half from the cottage when she first sees Willoughby's house at Allenham. The characters of Persuasion rack in some serious pedometer readings. Anne finds it most natural to make a daily walk to Lady Russell's house half a mile each day. The same feeling is shared by the Musgrove clan. Though Upper Cross Cottage and the Great House are a quarter of a mile apart, the two families were so continuously meeting, so much in the habit of running in and out of each other's houses at all hours. All of this running in and out quickly added up. It wasn't unusual for a Regency person going visiting or walking to nearby villages to easily rake in about seven miles in one day. In addition to milling about the house, Elizabeth Bennet therefore finds nothing very taxing in making the three-mile walk to Netherfield to visit Jane. I do not wish to avoid the walk. The distance is nothing when one has a motive. Only three miles. I shall be back by dinner. So off she trots, crossing field after field at a quick pace, jumping over stiles and springing over puddles with impatient activity. Even the spiteful Bingley sisters concede that Lizzie is, if nothing else, an excellent walker. She can easily walk through country lanes for two hours. While reading Darcy's letter and desperately wants to walk round the whole park of the Pemberley estate, a mere ten miles, but stops short because her aunt, who is not a great walker, could go no further. Even her marriage proposal isn't complete without a long walk and Darcy lasting several miles. Small wonder, considering her, considering her creator was such a passionate walker, too. Austin proudly styled herself as one of the desperate walkers of the world, walking about and enjoying the air whenever she could. One energetic in 1805, 
brought these Lizzie-like tidings from Jane's correspondence. Yesterday was a busy day with me, or at least with my feet and my stockings. I was walking almost all day. I went to Sydney Gardens soon after one and did not return till four, and after dinner I walked to Weston a mile and a half away. Austin naturally walked like an Elizabeth. Few of us can say the same today. Actually, we're walking more like the Elizabeth on the modern movie posters of Pride and Prejudice 2005. Look to the bottom and you'll find a tiny Kira Knightley confined to the walking distance of a typical parking lot. That's basically the extent of our walks today. The distance between our cars and office, cars and supermarket, cars and home, giving the average American less than an hour of cumulative walking time per day. And giving the rest of the world an endlessly amusing anecdote to tell their friends back home. Yes, I've seen it. They do get in their cars just to drive across the parking lot. Ha ha ha. Regency England was in a bit of a mo movement crisis, too. Better roads and comfier carriages meant walking was now an option for more people than ever before. As one 18th century doctor put it, the English gentry could now afford to be among the lazy, luxurious, and inactive. Over all the country, the rich were being shuffled along in sedan chairs. A sort of Regency people mover on poles carried by two miserable servants. Sedan chairs could zip you from one house to the next, dropping you off in the front parlor if it struck your fancy. You remember in Wives and Daughters there was one of those. And the lady that was in one said, we can just go from the carriage and into the house without even feeling the weather. <laughs> I would rather have walked. Regency carriages might have been comfier, but they still took a considerable time to rev up. Servants had to be summoned, horses had to be harnessed. It was usually quicker just to walk, especially when the destination was considered a most convenient distance, defined in Jane's novels as anything at or below one mile. Meryton village shops are a mile away from the Bennett home. Mrs. Weston moves the very easy distance of a half a mile walk from Emma's place and no self-respecting Austinite would dream of calling for the carriage in such a little way. Although if walking less than a mile to visit a friend or pop into a shop doesn't seem so convenient nowadays, you might need to recalibrate your distance scale to Regency standards. Start on the easier end of Austin's walkable distance rule. In Sense and Sensibility, Mrs. Dashwood defines her ideal distance of a walk as the quarter-mile stroll between her cottage and Barton Park, the same quarter-mile distance separating the two Musgrove houses in persuasion. So think like a Regency walker. If the places you normally go, parks, stores, restaurants, are within a quarter-mile distance from you, consider walking to them instead, and never, never repeat that dreadful habit of getting in your car only to drive across a parking lot. It is a compliment which I never pay to any place if I can avoid it. Um, you know, some people have suggested to park your car at the furthest end of the parking lot so you have to walk that far into the grocery store and then walk back out that same distance. And a lot of people have found great success in keeping fit and losing weight that way, always uh, walking the furthest they can. I'm trying to see how much time I have left and how much further I can go. I think I will just read a little bit more and uh, then stop and let you uh, go about your day. Characters who rely on other forms of exercise don't move nearly as much as organic walkers like Lizzie. In Mansfield Park, Fanny relies solely on horseback riding as her only means of exercise, the Regency equivalence of relying solely on the gym, and is constantly being prevented from exercising at all. One excuse after another pops up and somebody is always using the equipment she wants. Consequently, Fanny's overall physical fitness level is embarrassingly low. A mere half-mile walk and she's exhausted for the day. Not exactly the quickest heroine in the park. 
Fanny apparently hasn't figured out what everyone else in Austin world knows. When she does not ride, she ought to walk. Now, if, you, if it's winter and you're in your home, you could just take a turn about the house. And I often, when my children were home, we developed a route from one end of the house to the next and, and could walk it quite vigorously and uh, get some exercise and some walking in. Although it doesn't hurt to bundle yourself up and go out on your front porch, walk up and down your driveway, walk around the perimeter of your own house, and uh, that way you can get back in quite quickly and get warmed up. So you, there's really no reason to be sedentary unless you are ill or injured in some way. And even then, you'll want to have some kind of stretching or movement. In Austin world, a life can quickly change on a walk because walk and life were two concepts closely connected for Jane. Think of it as he described it. They often went on walks and met people. I'm sure that used to happen uh, back in the day. And uh, one of the orders she gives her characters in persuasion is the order to walk more, to walk for her life. Today, that order is as literal as ever in experiencing the life-changing magic of a daily walk walk starts by remembering the ground rules you know that is probably the first step towards good health is to walk just walk as far as you can don't get so far that you have to cripple yourself back remember you've got to walk back too we always think about that when we're down on the coast and we want to take that road up to the lighthouse up at uh uh trying to think where that where that is what the name of that is um, and we think oh yes I want to walk up to the lighthouse but then you've got to remember you've got to come back and it's a quite a fur piece <laughs> the first rule of Austin Walk Club now in that book the handy book for American girls there is a part in the summer section called form a walking club and if you I don't care how old you are, you're still a girl. And uh, even if you're elderly like I am, you could form a walking club with you, yourself, and you and just uh, uh, follow the rules about the walking club and go for a walk every day. The first rules of the Austin Walk Club. There are no rules in Austin Walk Club. In Northanger Abbey, Catherine and Henry are their happiest when walking is viewed as purely a voluntary activity. Walking where they liked and when they liked, their hours, their pleasures, their fatigues, and their own command. Turns out even laboratory mice feel the same, naturally hopping on and off running wheels at their own enjoyable pace, but force them to exercise and the stress involved can be easily outweigh the benefits. How much Austin grasped this but is evident by how conspicuously she kept herself from issuing any stringent walking guidelines. You'll find an incredible diversity of walkers and walking options in her novels. Fast walkers, slow walkers, morning walks, afternoon walks, evening walks, even moonlit walks. You know, like I said before, somebody ought to write down uh, a little book, The Art of the Walk all bound by nothing more than the sheer exquisite enjoyment of the activity. How you think about walking matters. A fascinating study in 2014 confirmed that people who thought they were walking for exercise rather than simply walking for pleasure were much more likely to reward themselves with unhealthy food choices for completing the activity. In Austin world, walking itself is the feel-good reward. You know, you don't have to reward yourself for things that become interesting and enjoyable to yourself. And that's why I suggest that you make homemaking something that is enjoyable. And there are many ways to do it. You can find ways to refresh the space, to redecorate, to rearrange, uh, to add interesting and um, bright spots to it. And, and just create different atmospheres. And I often try to leave you with some of the things that I've done that might give you some ideas for going further in your own home. If Austin characters 
have one biological motive for walking more. It's literally in their minds. Walking appears to magically boost and balance their mental health. Jane makes countless references to moods, feelings, and spirits being cheered and freshened up by walking. If only we had this kind of mindset when we first uh, start a home and have children is that they must we must be responsible for taking them on walks every day and I'm afraid it was uh, rather tempting sometimes mother wanted to get something done so she set the children you know down in front of a television set to watch cartoon while she did something but it would have been much better to have them um, at least play like they were helping and keeping them active but if only we knew when we had children that there are some things you have to do with your children and uh, they must be active and not sedentary except when they're sick uh, but most of the time I think people uh, are thinking the opposite Austin characters who walk more are measurably happier than those who don't people who are not in the habit of walking much like Mrs. Bennett tend to have gloomy thoughts you know that's true when you sit too much or recline too much, it's it's uh, phenomenal how much more anxiety and fear can come your way. But walking keeps all those gloomy thoughts away. While others, like Lizzie, naturally turn to walking to alleviate stress and anxiety. She walked up and down the room to compose herself. Oh, some of you probably remember your parents or your mother going for a walk just to uh, just to get the stress off or just to get something off of her mind that's bothering her or just to get out of the house for a while, away from the work. It's Austin's acknowledgement of an ancient belief, the concept that walking can effectively clear your head and one ba dating back to Greek, ph Greek philosophy is solved by walking. But it wasn't until 1999 that this belief was scientifically confirmed. A landmark study by Duke University found that quick walking for 30 minutes three times a week was just as effective as antidepressants in relieving the symptoms of major depression and over the long term even more effective than medication. An almost identical claim is made by Jane Fairfax in Emma. Quick walking will refresh me. We all know at times what it is to be wearied in spirits. Now remember in the previous video I was reading to you out of Beautiful Girlhood when it was suggested that her spirits, her mood was wearied and she would need time away and time alone and time to rest. Well, we need proper amount of rest and of walking. Those are two very good healthful remedies and they cost us nothing. And they don't have the side effects except good side effects. Moreover, the same Duke University study discovered that walking tends to boost people's confidence, giving them heightened feelings of self-regard. Is it any coincidence that the most iconic walker in the Austin world, Lizzie Bennett, is also the most iconically self-confident? Obstinate, headstrong girl, says Lady Catherine, the best backhanded compliment in the book. And uh, I will read just a little bit more here of this. You might want to just get this yourself and read it. I should be glad to take a turn. And I have told you about this in the past, that uh, you can take a turn around the room. You know, while sometimes we might tell uh, some of the older children, why can't you just settle down or sit down because they're walking through the house? Well, they need to. They need to move. <clears throat> while a nice long walk is a lovely treat in Austin world, even Regency schedules didn't always allow for them every day. The accomplished woman has to improve her mind by extensive reading sometime. So when compelled to sit for long periods, Austinites rely on a handy trick to keep them frequently on their feet, taking a turn. I'll try to explain this without sounding hopelessly disconnected from modern reality. Taking a turn is merely rising from your chair and pacing around whatever space is at your disposal. Hear Caroline Bingley's explanation in Pride and Prejudice. 
Let me persuade you to follow my example and take a turn around the room. I assure you it is very refreshing after sitting so long in one attitude. To quickly vindicate both of us, taking frequent turns throughout the day has indeed been shown to refresh you on a biological level. Even just two minutes of light walking for every 20 minutes of sitting significantly reduces both blood sugar and insulin levels. Two things always dangerously out of whack when sitting for prolonged periods. Remembering the Regency wisdom of taking a turn is especially crucial for desk workers. So three cheers to anyone clever enough to invent the app we've all been waiting for, one that periodically pings on your desk with Carolyn's sassy voice saying, let me persuade you to take another turn around the room. There is one of those watches. I have a friend that has one that rings at a certain time and makes, so she, she will get up and walk around. Now, since this has quite a few more pages on exercise, I might not be able to to finish it. Maybe I will. Uh, and uh, hopefully you're getting something done. There's nothing here to watch. And uh, so this next chapter is called The Whole Country Abounded in Beautiful Walks. It's unanimous. Austin characters prefer exercising outside. Whether that's scampering about the country, walking along garden paths, or climbing the hilly downs, rejoicing in their own glimpse of blue sky. And that's not because Jane didn't have access to, to a gym. The Regency era, in fact, had its fair share of indoor exercise options. Have you ever gotten on the web and looked at um, Regency or Victorian exercise apparatus and... Uh, I believe I read to you out of an old uh, women's magazine from the 1800s that was critical of these people, these girls that just wanted to exercise and how uh, they longed to see the feminine woman just taking a plain walk. There was the chamber horse for a exercise, it was like an exercise chair that hilariously mimicked horseback riding. Then there was the Regency version of a treadmill, walking in endless circles in indoor spaces. Catherine experienced its mind-numbing dullness in Northanger Abbey. Every morning they paraded up and down for an hour, looking at everybody and speaking to no one, the most tedious exercise in Jane's novels. For good reason, countless studies have confirmed Austin's intuitive intuition that fatigues within doors are worse. People who swap out the gym for the great outdoors consistently find exercising more pleasurable, more invigorating, and less tiring than when performing the same exercise indoors. And one of the things I never liked about formal exercise, like going to a, an exercise, joining a class and going there every day or every week, was that it exhausted you and you could when you came home well you couldn't do anything you couldn't get your housework done but walks and doing housework seems to be more invigorating run mad as often as you choose but do not faint now to tackle the running question, did Jane ever run? Did she approve of it? Surprisingly, there's quite a lot of running about in her novels, and all of it generally positive. For Marianne, the one consolation of having to hurry home during a rainstorm is the enjoyment of running with all possible speed down the steep side of the hill, which immediately led to their garden gate. In Pride and Prejudice, Lizzie beats her sister in a running match through the house and garden because Lizzie enjoyed the habit of running more frequently than Jane. We have foot races here on our floor. Uh, I do it with the little ones for my own exercise, but also to they. Uh, I ask them to teach me how to run. It gives them something to do and uh, a, a job. They get to train me how to run and jump. But all of this running comes in sporadic bursts. Nobody runs for prolonged periods of time in Austin world. 
running for too long over unnaturally long distance would have defied Austin's guiding health principle, moderation in all things. Historically speaking, long distance running has always been regarded as a rather dubious form of exercise. If you ever remember your Greek history, the first marathon runner of the ancient world collapsed dead at the finish line. As Austin would say, there are very few of us who have heart enough for it. Carried on for too long, the sheer heart-pumping intensity of running can dangerously enlarge, harden, and overstretch the heart muscle itself. Endurance runners are infamously prone to heart damage, and some of the most famous have suffered from heart attacks while still young. Moderation, therefore, should keep you, as it kept Jane, from ever running into excess. Walk mostly and only run occasionally, remembering that being absolutely out of breath from haste is not a prolonged sensation in Austin world. We'll finish our walk with Jane by not forgetting to take a refreshing rest from time to time. Like the intuitive exercisers they are, Austin characters listen to their bodies, know when they need a break, and never pressure themselves to power through. Enjoying a guiltless rest was certainly part of Jane's broader exercise philosophy. I am quite equal to walking about and enjoying the air, and by sitting down and resting a good while between my walks, I get exercise enough. Hence, her fictional walks are always conveniently dotted with comfy benches. You know, people did used to have benches around in their yards and gardens because you could walk for a while and then sit down. But we find them hard to mow around, so we don't have them out there. A few steps further brought them to a comfortable-sized bench on which they all sat down. For all of us, these natural rest periods are crucial for keeping exercise pleasurable and in its proper place in our lives. The world's first celebrity doctor was saying it 2,000 years ago, the right amount of exercise, not too much, not too little, is the safest way to health. Mary Bennett in Pride and Prejudice would only sniff and adjust her spectacles with an I could have told you so expression. Exertion, she kindly reminds us, should always be in proportion with what is required. Speaking of which, even resting has its hidden health secrets in Austin World, a place where you can legitimately exercise without ever moving a delicate ankle. It starts to rethink how you sit and stand. So, ladies, I'm going to end there and put a little marker there so we can start at the posture is thought good for me. I'm curious about posture because I think we were all taught to have posture like military posture, which might not have been, which might have been more fatiguing. So, um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about how important it is to teach your own children. I was having a conversation with one of my sons. And he and I were discussing the fact that his children are so important to him that he thinks that they are, there's something extremely special about them. There's a greatness in them, and they're very young, of course. I believe they're probably all under nine, but uh, he was saying that he he wasn't as interested in them becoming a great or have done done something very remarkable. And uh, we were discussing the fact that the greatness, if you can treat, teach your children to uh, grow up with good character, to be helpful and honoring to their parents and to love their home and uh, to teach them your, your, your special ways and your recipes and your uh, family habits and your traditions. And then they get married and... Uh, they go off and buy a little farm and they raise a family and then they start little churches even if they're on their own property or in their own home. Uh, that's greatness. That's what the world needs. And uh, we were talking about politics and things like that and 
I mentioned that there were some politicians that had been in uh, certain state uh, senates that had resigned because they were uh, elected and they were just new to it and they found it so corrupt it made them sick and they quit. <laughs> but you can never get sick of living right and living righteously. So you are a great success if you can teach your children just the simple, beautiful things of life, growing up and learning how to work at something that's beneficial to you and to your family, you know, developing a, a, some kind of, of work uh, that, that is not against anything that uh, is godly, and uh, then to get married themselves and have their own kids and uh, build a home life for themselves. This is greatness. This is absolutely the best thing because look how many people um, fail at it. That's why it is a great thing because it's hard for uh, many people to achieve. And so if we can train our the next generation how to do this or just to do it um, and encourage them. And one thing that I like to do, my uh, in-laws did this, is that every anniversary they would give us uh, and the others uh, as much as many dollars as we had been married years you know like if you've you've been married 30 years you'd get 30 dollars so <laughs> and those days uh that was quite a treat and the last i believe that the last money that we got was something like when we were married was it 39 years or something like that and um so and also to just encourage them and to be very very supportive of them and make it easy for them uh, to uh, to be enthusiastic about life at home and so ladies I hope that this has been somewhat beneficial to you and that you got a few things done I'll try and finish reading that chapter tomorrow and maybe talk about some other things so uh, please keep your comments coming and I'll talk to you later bye